Welcome to the 923rd meeting of the Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston. We have an exciting meeting tonight. The agenda is packed, and we have a, a great presentation by Al Takeda. He's uh, resurrecting his presentation from Stellafane. If you couldn't make that, and he's really talented, so I'm interested in learning a lot about what he's learned about uh, imaging with DSLR. So um, I do, uh, let's go to the next slide. So again, my president's welcome, so welcome everyone. I also wanted to make a special thank you uh, out to everyone that helped organize the picnic last weekend. It was awesome. I wasn't feeling great. I left a little early, but it was really great. And I hate to mention names, but I know Eileen, Al, um, Julie and John played a really big role, but a lot of other people were there setting up, they brought food, and it was a great time. And um, so I really appreciate it. And if you missed it, next year, it should be great. New okay. Year's. <laughs> well, the New Year's, absolutely. Uh, the Observing Committee Report, and Glenn, what was your favorite age teaching why? Uh, when I retired, sixty-five. Uh, <laughs> you know what? I think every year, probably the first year was terrible because I literally, I got my teaching job replacing a guy that the kids drove out. And my first day of school, first class, I came in, kid looked up and said, "We got rid of the last one." So that was. And literally, I went home. I was in a fetal position the whole night, but I, I survived, and the rest is history. I like that quote, by the way. Oh, what was it? I'm gonna go back. Is that all galaxies deserve to be stared at for full 15 minutes. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get a, a, an astronomy saying every, uh, every time we have a meeting, and Jim uh, Mullaney sent me a batch of them, so I've got a, and I'm saving one for Mario. He said you're not going to be here the next two weeks, so I'll put it on hold. And how, what kind of soulless individual would not like the moon? It was beautiful. Driving <laughs> <laughs> in, just following that golden orb. <laughs> All right, we're going to be at Tom the Equinox coming up, which means, of course, we are probably the only people of us have been uh, maybe uh, bats and vampires and whatever that like the nighttime for being longer. And, of course, it is getting earlier already, dark early. It's been very nice, and we start to see the Milky Way, at least from where I live a little better. We get rid of that summer hay. So we do have the autumnal equinox coming up. Uh, zodiac zodiacal light, I've never seen it. How many of you have ever seen it? Locally or way out someplace? How many have seen it locally? Where? The old days at the clubhouse. Oh, the old days. We have to go back in a time machine if we want to see it up there. Well, anyway, was that? Back to State Park. At the conjunction. At the conjunction. Texas Star Party. Okay, so it's up there. If you, if you travel about 500 miles from Boston, you should be able to see something there. <laughs> and then we have a couple of lineups of the, the moon and the planets. And I've always liked these, especially for beginners, because I'd say to my students, hey, if you go out tonight, look at that star next to the moon, that's Jupiter. And it happens that both Jupiter and Saturn are having, they're actually uh, occulting the moon, but not from our locale. But they'll be very close on those particular evenings. So that's a good lineup for, uh, uh, as far as uh, uh, naked eye observing. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. The Observer's Challenge, we had two in a row that were Messier objects, so we had a break from the faint fuzzies. And the one for September is uh, M71. Now, M71 is a result if the Pleiades and M13 had a child. It's kind of a cluster globule. It's really hard. In fact, it was very hard for astronomers to peg this thing because it was a really extremely rich cluster, a very poor globular cluster. Well, we know now uh, it is a globular cluster. And it's located about 10 degrees north of Altair and Aquila. And I did check it out. How many of you have seen this one already? I, was, I had forgotten how faint it is. I tried it with binoculars. I had seven, uh, seven by uh, 50s. And I really couldn't say I saw it because there are a couple of bright stars nearby. So I wasn't sure if I was really seeing the light from those stars. But again, with a small telescope, I was able to pick it up. We'll go to the next slide. We got pictures from uh, Doug Paul and Mario. Mario, this is, I think, yeah, there it is, over here. And I remember there's that double star nearby, and Gen General Hayes, in my small scope, we'll go to the next slide. Well, that, so that's Doug's picture. That's Doug's right there, and that's Mario. It's a little uh, larger scale for Mario, but it's about the same, it's the same orientation. Nice job, by the way. And a little bit different when you look at it with a small telescope. This is with a, an Edmund Astro scan, so it's a large field of view. 
And all I could basically see was just a smudge of light with a star right in the edge of it. And that was, again, about 56 power, about a one degree field diameter with an astro scan. So it is visible with small aperture scopes. But you'll want to check this one out because next month, we go to the faint stuff again. I think it's NGC 7448. So I'm writing up the article right now, so when you can get the pictures, you can really appreciate it. I got it. I just haven't processed it. I'll send it. Okay, great. Thank you. Doug's not here you. tonight. Yeah, oh, there you are. You are here. Same deal? Yeah, I've got it too. Okay, fantastic. I'm still, I've got to make an observation myself. I'm waiting for the, the moon to get out of the way. <laughs> 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 that beautiful orb. I, I used to work at a planetarium, and I got so spoiled. One night, the full moon was, I swear, I went for the control to just get the thing back down below the horizon, just to kind of get used to that. I think that's it. Yeah, again, keep looking up, and uh, we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. Eileen is up. I, I asked her to give a brief, brief update on Stella's Bay, on how that went. Oops. The, the observing at Stella Bay was terrific. It did not rain. There was no <laughs> Stella rain at all. So a few clouds, but it was, it was great. So there, um, I ran the Observing Olympics, which is a program where you get a piece of paper, 25 objects, and a description with an image of each of the objects. Some that you, there's one list for a telescope, there's another list for binoculars, and if you find 15 of the 25, you win a pen. I did that because for years I've been going to Stellafane, and every time someone would say, come look at my telescope, I would see M13, and I would see the Ring Nebula, and I would see M13, and I would see the Ring Nebula. <laughs> So now there's a great program going on. So I had a good time running that. I met a lot of people. People bring up uh, these night vision scopes that I get to look through. You hold it up and you see the sky, see all the nebula. You don't even have to look for it. It's right there. So that was fun. Uh, the part I liked the best was Alan Ward, who's a gentleman from Canada, brought a mirror coating machine. And it can be used to coat up to 10 and a half inch mirrors. And he coated mirrors like crazy um, the whole weekend. So if you brought your own mirror, you could have a coating done. And he, he had it, you could see it glowing at night. It was, it was amazing to see. He set up a camera, he had a TV screen, and it was all set up for education so that he can bring it to schools and everyone can see how this whole process works. So that was fun. And of course, I run the, um, the lectures that are held in the Pavilion and the McGregor. I get the speakers. And we had five ATMOB members present. Uh, Cory Mooney gave a talk on, on 3D imaging, which I didn't get to see, in the um, McGregor Observa Observatory Library. Al Takeda gave a talk on astro uh, 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 photography. And who else? We had Gary Walker, club member, gave a talk on CMOS, the next imaging revolution. And George Roberts gave a talk on the bath interferometer. And Phil Ransville, who's over there, gave a talk on the Gregorian, an alternative for the planetary and lunar observer. And um, we all had a great time. I need to talk about the eclipse. Oh, that's right. You gave a talk on the eclipse. Al Alan Slisky gave a, a talk on the eclipse. And you gave one to, that's right. You <laughs> <laughs> I did this about an hour ago. So you, uh, Mario and um, Brad Beegee gave a, a joint talk on uh, Pro-Am. Uh, that you got very inspired when they were done and wanted to get out there and, and actually do some science. And that's going to be the theme of next year's Stella Fane. At the Hartness House, there'll be more speakers on how to really get involved into Pro-Am, and the, probably the Pavilion will have some speakers on that as well. So that was Stella Fane. Those were the things that I liked about Stella Fane. However, there was also conjunction. And at that, we had Julie Kaufman, who gave a talk on her, uh, her astronomy travels, and Rich Nugent gave a talk on the lunar observer. So, a long version. <laughs> <laughs> so our club has been very busy. Our members. Thanks, Emily. That's great. Okay, next up, Mario is going to regale us in what his favorite sport is. Favorite sport. <laughs> 
So this is the scope. It was built in 1917, uh, at the time the biggest scope in the world, and was uh, uh, Hubble's telescope where he did all his early research on the expansion of the universe. It has a uh, primary focus up top uh, that's not uh, being used right now. They have a separate cage and a Cassegrain focus, but it's an unusual Cassegrain where the uh, they have a sec I can't show it. <laughs> they have a, a tertiary mirror here, goes off to the side, and that's where uh, Hubble leave a lot of his uh, images. So this is Hubble at that spot, <coughs> and they had a slide set with a, uh, a slide where they would he could observe and then put in the uh, the plates for imaging. I wanted to take a picture of myself with that, but they don't use that anymore. Oh, here's a slide plate, and that's the original one uh, Hubble used. So this is why they don't use it anymore. It's actually a, a, a lift stand, and that's the chair he used. The problem is the director right after Hubble sat there, fell down, broke both his legs, and they've never used it since. <laughs> Fortunately, Hubble didn't injure himself, but they adapted the scope in a different way. Uh, well, I'll get to that in a moment when you see it. So this is uh, when they were hunting. Uh, Hale is one of, the, one of those people there. They, took up a couple of scopes and just traveled all along the uh, San Gabriel Mountains trying to find the spot to put up a big telescope. And they eventually picked Mount Wilson. This is building the dome back then. Uh, this is, uh, oh, what's his name? I'm blocking on the, uh, Richie, who uh, ground, it took four years to make, uh, to grind the mirror. And he wasn't happy, they got the glass from Paris they uh, sent the original one back, and then they brought another one. He didn't like that. He refused to polish it. He said it was a piece of junk. But then the war broke out, and Dale basically said, you want a job, you, you polish this one. Uh, so he did polish it, and it came out pretty good. In fact, that's one of his something I would have pitch laps that he used, the original. And this is how they brought the mirror up, <laughs> and different parts. That's the mirror, they believe it or not. I think that was actually the 60 inch mirror. I thought. Here is parts of the scope, and notice that they have a uh, tackle up top to keep it from tipping over. The road wasn't that good back then. And here is the middle part of the scope being brought. I just like these historical photos. Trucks were different back then. They had a number of notable visitors, including Einstein and others. So here it is now. It's a, still an imposing looking building. As night came on, they opened up the dome. And what was interesting is he had one of the panels off, so I actually got to touch the mirror. <laughs> uh, which I probably wasn't supposed to do, but I didn't care. It was good. <laughs> and uh, in order to use it these days, what they did, so that you don't have to, I a laser pointer, but where the original observing point was up there, they put a flat, and right. another flat. All right. All right. That's okay. Another flat, and basically you observe from the ground. 
it's still a Cassegrain mode, but it goes to a couple of flats. But he did very well, and the quality of the viewing was still uh, excellent. So uh, works out pretty well, actually. You don't have to get in a dangerous position. That's the mirror, and that's the observing point. Uh, so as the night went on, I got to observe. Uh, the only problem is this will spoil you for life. <laughs> when, I came, when I went home, I was very dejected and said to my wife, you know, my little 32 inch just doesn't do it anymore. <laughs> uh, I was told in no uncertain terms, we're not building another house, so <laughs> it was really too bad. Here's a photo as the, uh, we started observing, it was uh, looking at Jupiter. Now, we didn't, one of the many, we looked at a bunch of things. We did not look at the moon, okay, thank goodness, <laughs> blind. But we did get to look at Saturn's moons as little moons. We could make out colors on it. Uh, and there was a transit at the time of Io, in, I'm sorry, Ganymede, right in front of uh, uh, Jupiter. And you could see the colors uh, separate. You can see the uh, transit was quite sharp. Uh, Jupiter, the red spot, could see the uh, stuff being blown off, just like uh, what Hubble shows you. It was amazing. I saw all that visually. Saturn later in the night, a uh, whole bunch of things. But the field of view in the Cassegrain mode is 5.5 arc minutes. So it came with a list of small objects. So we looked at a bunch of planetaries and cores of some galaxies. 7331, for example, just made it inside of the field of view. And that was uh, spectacular. <coughs> Uh, we looked at Campbell's uh, star, which is a, I've seen through my scope, it's a, like, it looks like a red rim around the star, and this you could cleanly see it separate. It's a new nebula just starting to form. So there were a, a number of uh, objects we looked at. Uh, the, um, the ring nebula is one of them that was, I, I, I can't describe it, it'll make you mouth water. But I had the best feeling of my life, it's ingrained. Uh, they said we, if we had a group, we could reserve like in a, a year in advance. I'm thinking of doing this in about two or three years. If 10 people want to go out for 200 bucks each, let me know. Yes. Except we should do Awesome. Thank you very much, Mario. And so without further ado, I want to introduce Al Takeda, who is a prominent member in the club also. He's been our newsletter uh, editor and everything else, almost everything else associated with the newsletter for many years. But he's also uh, was the treasurer, no, secretary. Was secretary of the club, and has been a member at large for a number of years now. And is, uh, is a prominent member at the clubhouse also. So uh, I don't feel like I have to say much about Paul, but uh, I mean uh, about Al. But uh, I'm really excited to hear his, his talk about a DSLR imaging. So with that, right, I'd let's like to uh, switch, switch over. Switch over. Right. Yep. So I'm going to ask Al a question. I'm going to ask him what his favorite telescope is. <laughs> My favorite telescope is the Epsilon 180 hyperbolic astrograph. Very fast, and you'll see some of that when I uh, talk about it. See my talk. start by saying that this talk, lights, uh, lights. no, not yet, <laughs> I don't know about the lights, um, that the talk is generally a intermediate talk. It's not a basic beginner, nor it's advanced. Now I'm going to have, I will talk, a few, I will intersprinkle a few facts and a few high level uh, interesting uh, things about uh, DSLR imaging, but uh, no, just, just put it down. I'll do it later. 
It's too complicated for you, Mario. I'll have to give you a lesson how to use that eye, but that will be later. Yeah. Uh, okay. So basically, deep sky imaging with uh, digital single lens reflex cameras. So with Canny camera, you can take, use it to take daytime pictures. You can take trips, as some of the trips I've been on, which were also eclipse trips, so by the way. And so in Egypt or China. And you can also use it to take, say, bird you know, imaging. But for the most part, I'm going to talk about how to take DSLR imaging, deep sky imaging, with a DSLR camera. This is a double cluster rule, by the way. So, you know, as we know, there are a lot of cameras out there. There are different models, different makes. But what I do is I like the digital SLR, the Canon digital SLR cameras. Because, I don't know, for some reason, I think that Canon, there must be some engineer within Canon that actually knows how to do astro imaging. Because most of the controls for the Canons are one, either right at the top or one level down. So a lot of these settings that you make are right there. So let's actually talk about the DSLR you know, camera. So I actually have four, and I've only listed three of them, but I actually have four DSLR cameras. I have, of course, the T1i Rebel, which is my primary uh, astro camera. I have my T4i Rebel. And then these are the bare bones models, and they're, un they're not modified. They're standard daytime cameras. I also have the 1D Mark IV which is the camera that Mario was trying to use. Uh, I have to give him a camera on how to use it because it's even complicated for me. But it's, that's my day, mostly my daytime camera. I also have my first camera, which I didn't actually list here, this Canon 20D. So when I did this talk, I did this, this talk about nine years ago. And it was just to introduce people to DSLR photography. And I'll we'll talk about some of these facts. But anyway, here are some of the data that we have online up here. You know about the CMOS, they are CMOS chips, the APS-C, uh, APS-CS, and of course the Mark One, the Mark Four, sorry, is the APS-H chip. And here are some. But one of the biggest things is got to have certain options. One is their lockup, and USB and shutter control connectors. So here's the DSLR advantage: uh, they, they can be used during the daytime, and you know they're relatively inexpensive compared to a dedicated. CCD or some of the new CMOS cameras that will be coming up in the future. And then you have some of the price listings now that may have changed every year they bring out a new model. Uh, but you can go as inexpensively as possible by, by used or buying new. It's a little more expensive, but it, one of the nice things is you can use many lenses, many telescopes. And also, if you don't like imaging, you can get rid of it. And there will be buyers that will buy that camera. So let's talk about the T1i, which I use as my primary astro camera. You notice it's you know, CMOS, complement and metal uh, oxide semiconductors. And the reason why there, a lot of the professional cameras that are actually going to CMOS is these can be produced in the same fab lines as the chip makers. You don't have to have a separate fab line, a fabrication line. Like for CMOS cameras, you have to have a separate system <coughs> to build these. Well, for CMOS, you guys are building the same fab line, uh, and they're cheaper. Uh, so that's where they're going. So, and of course, the new technology is going to make the CMOS even better. Uh, Gary Walker gave a talk on the SCMOS chips uh, at Stellaframe. Uh, so these are the data, and of course, here are the size, the actual size. So 22.5 millimeter by 15 millimeter. These are big chips. That's what's nice thing about these large chips. You know, it's inexpensive for the size of the chip. So, and these are 4.7 microns. And of course, here's the actual sensor, the, the inside. So here's the actual chip. And this interesting thing here is the IR, blo IR blocking filter. Now, one of the things about a DSLR camera, daytime camera, is that it's not as good as a dedicated astronomy camera because of this filter. But you can still do a lot, and I'm going to see some of the photos that actually show you that you can do a lot with these cameras. So this is a pictorial representation of the bare array. This is the chip. You notice something interesting. You see there's a lot more green and blue pixels than the red pixels, because the red pixels are extremely sensitive. And so that's why if we did not have this infrared blocking filter, 
And if you took a picture without that filter on there during the daytime, everybody's skin will be absolutely beat red because it's actually bringing in more infrared. So a lot of the new cameras that are coming out for astronomy, they actually remove this blocking filter. I'm going to be getting one of these uh, cameras probably this year to do a little more astronomy. So here's some of the data. We've got a lot of cameras uh, up here. We've got a lot of different sensor sizes. <coughs> and the reason why I bring this up is let's talk about the chip itself. So determine the arc seconds per pixel. So the question is, are DSLRs and my scope matched? And now, and it's all about Nyquist theory, and I'm not going to go through all of that. And this, we have some of the math. Essentially, basically, for the most part, most of these cameras, they're going to be basically pretty good. You know, so the pixel size are pulled up in my, in my camera for my Epsilon 180, which we'll talk about later, is pretty good. So it's not going to, you're not going to have blocky pixels, and you're not going to get oversampling, which means that you're going to have the light being spread out, and you have to you know, take more images in order to get the same image. So in general, DSLRs for particular scopes are you know, pretty, you know, they're just about right for the pixel sizes. So deep sky requirements for the astro cameras. So you have to have manual control. That's the big thing about astro cameras. You've got to block up that mirror. You got to have some remote shutter release or a USB interface. You know, live view is nice, and most of the modern cameras have that. And of course, removal lenses. You got to remove the lens so that you could either attach it to a telescope or to put other lenses on. And so, let's actually talk about it. So, let's say you don't want to go to computers. You can use these timers, and these are called interferometers. They're interval timer remotes. And you can, do a, you can actually program your camera using plugging this in to actually do more than 30 seconds. So generally speaking, when you take, use a digital SLR, you can only get about 30 seconds worth of images unless you have either computer control or you have one of these special interval remote timers. And a lot of times when I'm done out in the field, when I didn't want to bring drag my computer, I use one of these timers. And you can go two minutes, three minute exposures. So here's the other way, which is, of course, the computer controls, lenses. So one thing about Canon lenses is what, the one thing you do not want to buy is the EFS, the EFS lenses. Because what happens, they have different spacing. So you always want to get the EF lenses, better quality. Uh, but also, it doesn't stick into the, um, the mirror housing. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Adapters. Well, you need these adapters in order to hook up your telescope. There are basically two types. You have the two inch adapter, and the reason I say two inch is you don't want a vignette. Basically, if you have an inch and a quarter, you're gonna cut off some of the light coming into, into the camera from the telescope. So you want, you want to definitely be at least two inches. The other is, of course, the T adapter, which will give a better support. It, the one problem with this, with the two inch, it could slide if you don't really tighten it down. It could shift and move. So I prefer using the T adapter system. This is my older setup. Uh, I haven't used this in a while because I've actually gotten a new mount. But this is my old G11 system. Here's the computer setup, and of course the million, millions of wires that I use. Um, yes, yeah, so you're going to need all of that, and I'll explain why I need all those wires. Um, but, so let's talk about what I have. So back then, I used, this is about 10 years ago. It's a Lost Mandy G11. It is the best bang for the buck when it comes to mounts. Um, so I have, I'm using a seven inch F2.8 hyperbolic astrograph. That's the Epsilon 180. That's this guy up here. It's the primary scope. I use a guide scope with a CC auto guider. And I'm using the Canon T1i. Uh, it used to be the 20D, that's what I started with. Uh, that was an older camera. It was the first camera that I actually wanted that made the leap into digital. I was a film guy for the long, for many, many years. I used film, I used hypersensitized film, you know, I used black, special black and white, technical pan 2415, for some of the people that remember those old films. Uh, the problem was there had, you know, reciprocity failure, so I had to hyper the film. So when I went to digital, it was just an epiphany. 
course, two heaters. You need two heaters when you're out there most of the night. And, you know, as we know, New England weather, you get a lot of dew. Laptop computer, and of course, the software to run it. So here's a close up of my system. And, you know, I still use this system. I've, you know, been using it for over, you know, 12 years. But here's the, here's the Epsilon 180. Uh, it's about 500 millimeters of focal length. And this guide scope, it's an Orion Short Tube 90. It's an Acrobat. You know, it's not even corrected for some of the color, but it still works fine for auto guide. So I actually have upgraded. So this is my new mount. It's new used. I bought it used from a guy in Colorado. This is the Astrophysics 900. And it's amazing, now I can get, instead of having, say, uh, maybe six out of every 10 uh, image sessions go right, it's now almost 100% um, by not using that old mount. So I've actually semi-retired the old mount. And of course, here's, you can actually see the setup where you actually attach the camera. And actually, the Epsilon 180 was actually made for DSLR cameras. I mean, when you look at some of the Takahashi's um, uh, advertisements, you see they have a DSLR camera attached, and it's matched up very well. So the Epsilon 180, here's some of the data about the Epsilon 180. It's a corrected Newtonian, basically. It's got a hyperbolic primary, and it's got a flat field lens in the focusing tube. And it's a photographic-only instrument. If you were to put an eyepiece, and you do have to put an eyepiece in here sometimes in order to collimate. The problem is, you'll see, this is for a flat chip. So if you actually take a photo, you will have round circles at all corners. There will be, it's completely round. I mean, there's no um, problems with coma with this scope. Guide scope, as I talked about before, it's a, it's a um, short tube 90, Orion short tube 90, Acromat. And I can get down to ninth or 10th magnitude stars. And I use the, for my auto guider, a lot of people use very tiny auto guiders, you know, but very small chips. <laughs> I decided to go the different direction. I decided to get an S big ST8300 camera. Okay, it's a little more expensive, but you know, I got 13, you know, the, the chip size is 13 by 18 millimeters in size. It's a two degree field with the setup. So I got any star in the field. I can use all these stars in the field. I don't have to worry about not finding a star to auto guide. Imaging software. Now, the imaging software I use is Images Plus. It's got made by a guy named Mike Unsold, and it is a fantastic imaging software uh, camera control for my, DSL, my, for my DSL camera, the Canon cameras. I also use Backyard EOS. I purchased the Backyard EOS when I was doing solar imaging uh, for the total solar eclipse that we had, um, the one that was, came across America. Auto guard control, I use the old CCD soft version 5. And of course for the histogram, and we'll talk about later about histograms, uh, the Canon Digital Photo Professional. And the, the planetarium program you use currently is the Skydex. So let's actually talk about my workflow. So of course you assemble the mouse, you attach the telescopes, cameras, electronics, wires, and wires and more wires. You balance the scope. And so the reason why I say east side heavy and it's a nice moniker, I, it's a nice saying, because you want to press against the gears, you want a little bit of weight on the east side, so it's always pressing against the gear, so as the scope is moving toward the west, it's always pushing against the gear, so you don't have any flopping around on the gears, on the worm gears. So of course you polar line. So I used to use a polar scope, I also star drifted, but currently I have the QHI pole master to do my uh, uh, my polar alignment, and that has completely solved a lot of problems, including my back. I don't have to lean over <laughs> to stare through the polar scope in some odd angle trying to get polar alignment. And that's the reason why we have to do polar alignment, because the stars move across the sky all night around the celestial north pole. Of course, there's Polaris in that arc there, and of course the celestial north pole is there. It's not on Polaris itself. So I launch Images Plus, turn on the software, get it running. I make sure I put the right destination folder in there instead of you know, putting folder, you know, 
photos on top of other photos and my other directories. And of course, I put in all the exposure parameters, making sure it's the right exposure. And I take test shots, and then we'll talk about it in a moment. And so this is basically the workflow. And these are all the pictures I take. You know, I take flat field pictures, light frames for focusing, light frames for exposure settings, light frames for the subject, dark frames and bias frames. You know, I take all these preliminary photos in the beginning because I want to make sure that I'm actually on target, looking at the right subject. <laughs> because, you know, taking pictures of things that you can't see sometimes, uh, you have to take a long exposure <laughs> just to see that you're in the right field. That's where the planetarium programs help. I actually don't have computer control of my mount. I, mean, I still use a hand control. That'll be someday, you know, when I have time. Um, but big thing is they have to take calibration frames. And the calibration frames will help you later in post-processing because they get rid of a lot of the problems you have in, you know, in your original images. <clears throat> One is the flat field. Because you, know, you, you need an evenly illuminated frame. It removes a netting, dust motes, and other artifacts. Dark frames, uh, you take a picture with the lens cap, you the lens cap on there, or a shutter closed, and that gets rid of your heat noise. And you have to take an exposure the same as your light frames. These are trying to get rid of all the heat frames, and we'll, I'll show an example in a moment. And the other bias, which is the shortest possible exposure, so that all you're doing is you get the minimum noise of the camera system. So there's a flat field. This is a flat frame from my Epsilon. Now, I've accentuated a lot of this so you can show you some of the artifacts. But you can see it vignetting up here at the top. You see, you know, it's not exactly flat. You see it's really bright in the center, and you got a little darkness on the outside. Well, that's vignetting. And you're going to get that in all telescope systems. No, nobody knows that's why you have to make a flat field. You're trying to get rid of all these artifacts. Here's a dark frame. Now, <laughs> this was taken in this, what I did, now granted I did, it, you know, <coughs> stretch the exposure a little bit just to show you what we see. So all these the red dots here, this was taken with a DSLR in the middle of summer when it was very hot. And so those are all hot pixels. And they just filled the frame. And oh, you see this little curvy thing over here. My old Canon 20D had a problem. Um, and it, it generated heat at the edge because the amplifier was right here just off the frame. So of course, remember, these camera DSLRs are made for daytime photography, very short exposures. They're not, they were never meant for nighttime photography. They were never meant for after photography. But you can compensate for this by taking these calibration frames. And there's the bias frames. Now, <laughs> you can actually see the rows and columns of the entire, of, of the chip itself. Focusing. So what I usually do with my system is, I don't have autofocusing. <laughs> So what I do is I take a picture and I magnify it. I magnify a bit Jesus out of it. So I, that's why it's nice to look at it on the computer because you can just enlarge, 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 enlarge. And I'm actually using the diffraction spike of the spider. So this is actually the diffraction spike of the spider. And when I know I am in perfect focus, not only, you know, normally you get a double cross here. When you get start getting a single cross, you know you are absolutely in focus. Now, when you are absolutely positively in focus, you notice this little bit of color you see? That's diffraction. You know you're perfectly in focus. Yes, Mary? Do you get ghosting if you use, if you focus on a bright star for a few frames? Yes, uh, that's called a res residual bulk imaging. Yes, you do get a ghost image if you do Even it. on a CMOS? Even on a CMOS, yeah. You, you do get a little bit. No, I, I you... never focus on a bright right. star. But you have to, because you need a really nice bright star. But what you do is you just wait a few minutes. It will go away. It will not stay. With CMOS, it doesn't stay. CCD, it will actually, it's called bulk, um, bulk image. In a, um, Stays for 20, yeah. 30 minutes for me. On a CCD camera, it will, yeah. yes. That's why on a CCD camera, you don't do this kind of thing. But on a CMOS camera, you can. It'll, it might be there for maybe one image, but the next image, it's gone. It's flushed out. So. CMOS, yes, you don't do this. CCD, uh, uh, sorry. CMOS, you can do this. CCD, you can't. So then you start up your auto guider. And what's nice about a new, uh, a better mount is that you can actually go up to four seconds. So what happens, so something about, let me talk about auto guiding for a second. So when you're auto guiding, it depends on the scene. 
Now, let's say one of the things that we worry about when we're looking at for a nice auto-guided image is that the, we worry about the jet stream. Where's the jet stream tonight when you're imaging? If the jet stream is overhead, it's going to be, it's really rolling the atmosphere. The atmosphere is being rolled around. It's, it's really unstable. So here's the problem with the jet stream. So you want the jet stream to be about 100 miles away to get great images, good, good scene. So if you start to expose that one second when you're auto-guiding, what will happen, happen, it's taking exposure every second, and it's correcting every second. So what's happening is, if the atmosphere is really boiling, what will happen, your auto-guider will actually, with modern auto-guiders, it will see that shift. It will actually see that movement of the star. And through all of, you know, it was, and it will actually track on the scene. So if it's really, if it's a night in which you just cannot seem to track right, you increase the exposure to about, you know, I can do it on my mount, I can go four seconds or five seconds because the mount is capable of doing that. Your mount will be different. You have to experiment. But in that case, in four seconds, the star is doing this. It's bouncing around, but it's averaging out. So instead of being a dot, on a really nice scene night. It's now a just big blob, but the auto guider doesn't care. It'll see this blob averaged out and will guide on it. And now you've averaged out, so now your auto guider's not moving like this and trying to stay up and track the scene. So sometimes when you're not, you may have to go increase the exposure. And that was a hard lesson to learn for me in the initial when I first started to do auto guide. So here's some. Here's an exact, what I call my dog bone photo. You see this? Uh, that's actually purely out of character. You know, you normally have problems with the Earth's rotation, you got motor drive fluctuation, and periodic errors in the worm gear. And this is what happened when I was really balanced it correctly. I didn't make it east side heavy. And so it kept moving, it kept hitting the gear, then it would stop, and it would move in the middle, and then it would hit the other side of the gear, and then it would go back. And so it moved, and there are two spots, you see, that it auto guided really well, like right up here, right down here. Everything in between, well, it's slightly blurred, it's moving. So, right now, so now I'm starting to, I enter all my image exposure. And let's talk about the histogram. Now, I wanted, this is one of the things that you have to learn in DSLR imaging. The histogram is your peak brightness. So, in a lot of cameras, you do to have the histogram in the camera, it's in, in the camera, or it's in the software that attaches to the camera. So here's a histogram up here. That's a chart. So that's the peak brightness. Now, let's think about this. So this is zero at the left, on the, all the way to the left side. Zero is completely black. There's no information, nothing. There's nothing there. That's, the right side is 100%. That's completely white. It's completely washed out. There's no information. It's just bright. Well. For DSLR imaging, you want that histogram, that peak exposure, to be between 30 to 40 percent. So it shouldn't be all the way to the left, it shouldn't be all the way to the right, it shouldn't be in the middle. And so here's some, another interesting factoid. Do not go above 50 percent, because what will happen is you start to lose detail. Because you will start, it will be too bright, and you, once you lose that detail, you can't bring it back. It's gone. So you always want, so what you want to do is you want to keep it between 30 and 40 percent. And so you take a picture, you take a few pictures, and it varies every night. Some nights, because it's hazy, or there are clouds in the sky, that, so maybe on one night, say in this case, that night was 90 seconds. I was able to take a 90 second exposure. On another night that was absolute beautiful, you know, it was a winter night, it completely cleared out, good seeing, I was able to go three to four minutes. Other nights in the middle of summer, I may only go 30 seconds. So depending on the sky conditions, that histogram may vary. So you have to take a, 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 a test shot to see what histogram. And you read the histogram, you take a look at it, you average it out to get the exposure. And that's the exposure you set for that night. Then you have an exposure, then you take as many pictures as you can. It's all about a signal to noise. You know, lots of signal, very little noise. You never get rid of noise. Noise is always there. But what you want to do is you want to have lots of signal and very little noise. So signal will increase much more rapidly than the noise. But in order to do that, you have to take a lot of photos. You take as many photos as you can throughout the night. 
So let's actually talk about processing. So now you've got all these pictures, you know, all these photos, you've got hundreds and hundreds of pictures, but now you've got to start processing. Well, I also use Images Plus for my processing because one of the nice features about Images Plus is that you can just dump all the images. So you can just take all my lights, all my darks, you know, I, all my flats, and just, just dump them into the folders. And I hit the process button, and it will do all the calibration for me. I don't have to manually do this. It will do it for me. So I can have hundreds of pictures. I turn it on. I go out to dinner. I go, I, I leave. I let it chug away. I let a computer do what computers do well, which is repetitive work. And I, it may go for an hour as it's processing all these, calibrating all these images. Next thing I have to do, I have to stack. I have to line it. So you have to line all these pictures up. Because you know, even if you're auto-guiding, it still may vary by a pixel or two as it's, as it's moving. Some, it may be rotating a little bit. Something may have shifted. So you do an align. And again, it's another automatic feature. And so you next to stacking, you combine them. And then you think, OK, I just stacked 100 pictures. It's going to be a beautiful picture. And you look at it and say, where's my picture? I don't see anything. Well, that's because this is just stacked and combined. What you have to do is you have to stretch the image. And one of the nice things, once you start, and here's something that newbies tend to get this wrong. They sometimes stretch too much and you bring in other artifacts. So nothing, there's no free lunch. You want to increase uh, your stretching. You want to bring out some of the detail, but not too much. And you start to say, so here's the histogram, how it looks now, which is there's no detail here. But once I do the breakpoint down here, this is what was in that photo. So it went from this photo to that photo in actually one step. And you actually see the histogram. It's a much more even histogram. And this is the elephant trunk right here. And here's the photo. Now I throw it, next I throw it into Photoshop, or you can use any of the other imaging processing programs. I use Photoshop because I bought it a long time ago and very steep learning curve. And here's the elephant trunk and all the nebulosity around it. So let's actually show some pictures. Let's see some pretty pictures. Now, one of the things you can do, you don't have to have it connected to a telescope or to guide on it. You can actually use a tripod. And so here's one of the setups I use for tripod imaging, using a DSLR camera, using camera lenses. And so you can do certain polar star trails. Or you can do, now it doesn't show this very well on, the, on this projector, but this is actually the Milky Way. Uh, you can actually see the teapot right here of Sagittarius. And here's you can see the Milky Way. Now, it's not showing very well in this image, but it actually was tracking. I tracked it for uh, about an hour. And you can actually see the Milky Way moving across the, the field. And then here's the, actually the Dome Observatory at Cellophane. You can see the steam coming out of it. Yeah, yeah. Some clouds. Yeah, you always have clouds. You never seem to get away from clouds, can you? All right, so. So the other thing we can do, now we can we, we moved on from um, tripod shots. Oh, by the way, uh, there are other shots, because we're talking about deep sky, I did actually show you some of the other shots I've taken, which you can do constellation shots. You can also do aurora pictures using a tripod and stack the image together to make movies. So here's my other setup. This is my Eclipse, international eclipse chasing gear. It's my, it's my little, it's a, um, what do you call it, the um, Takahashi Sky Patrol, little mini mount. And I took this for many years. I still take it into when I'm going overseas, uh, on overseas trips for total solar eclipses. Because it's small, it's light. Uh, that's my 400 millimeter lens with a 1.4 times adapter on it, along with my uh, DSL camera with my shutter release. And that's what I use to take eclipses shots. And that's the setup. And of course, I purchased other little tracking gear. This is the Ioptron Star Tracker. And by doing these, using this, you can take pictures like this. This is a call out to Sagittarius in the Milky Way region. And this was taken with a, my old Canon 20D and with a 14 millimeter Samyang. And these are just five minute, images, six minute subframes. So this shot was taken, this was actually taken in, at Bailey Hill in New Hampshire. And so I can, in that dark sky location, I can go six minutes. And but you have to track for six minutes or it would be blurred. And I was down in Australia, 
and we went out one night after the eclipse, and we went out to the outback, and you can see the large and small magnetic clouds, and that was taken with that setup that you saw before, tracking away, and you know just a few minutes, and you can you know get this in the southern. It was hard to get that the southern um, southern sl uh, celestial north uh, south pole. Trying to find it was, was difficult because I'm not used to seeing it. And of course, the other way is, of course, the telescope. You know, attach your camera to the telescope. And again, here's the setup I use, which is the, uh, the Takashi Epson 180. That's my favorite scope I use a lot. It gives you an almost three to four degree field. So it's extremely wide field with this setup with the DSLR camera. And so I've taken stuff like the Witch's Room, which is the Veil Nebula, and 52 Cygni right here. And you can start to see, I mean, this projector doesn't show it well, but you can start to see some of the knots inside the veil. Of course, our old favorite, M42, and the Running Man up here. And of course, the photo that you saw initially, which is the IC434. By the way, IC434 is that nebulosity back there, and the horse head, and the flame nebula right there, and it's in Orion. Of course, Messier M M13 in Hercules, a globular cluster. And I've also taken galaxies and planetary. So here's the owl planetary up here. And right down here, you have M108, Messier 108. And that's in Bursa Major. Again, these are multiple pictures. They're not a single picture. So it's multiple pictures, maybe 30 or 40 pictures I've taken. And these are actually were take these pictures were taken with the old Canon 20D. So it was an older camera, older technology, older electronics, but it still did a reasonably good job. There's some galaxies. Again, it looks much better on the laptop screen, but again, you can see it. And I think you might be, I don't know, maybe the uh, the TV screen above, you may be able to see it better. But you know, there's M81, maybe too. Of course. M31, of course, the old favorite in Andromeda. Of course, M31, uh, M32, and Messier 110. And so this is this is an interesting one. This is M33, Messier 33, another galaxy. And this is taken with the T1i, with the Epsilon 180. And one of the nice things I like to look at here is we can actually see some nebulosity here and here. Those are H-alpha regions, very similar to um, M, uh, uh, sorry, M42 uh, in our galaxy. And this was taken with an unmodified digital SLR. So these are not modified cameras. These are just standard, off-the-shelf, daylight cameras. That, and you can see some of the velocity there. In theory, you should not see it. But practically, you can image these. Now, I've had to take a lot more pictures to see it. Uh, because H alpha, very little H alpha light gets through that infrared blocking filter, which is on every DSLR camera. But you can see it. And you can do other things. An example M51, the supernova 2011 DH. So here's the supernova here, and that's M51. And this was taken, it's uh, taken with a, uh, not with the Epsilon, but with the uh, TMB92. It's a apochromatic re uh, refractor by Thomas M. Mack. It's a Thomas M. Mack telescope. <coughs> and you could also take other things. You can do two things. Not only can you take deep sky, which is a double cluster here, but you also take a picture of Comet Hartley 2 as it was going by the double cluster. Now, I have to, there's something interesting about this photo that a lot of people don't know. Most people think that the double cluster is just these stars surrounding the area here. I actually looked at a paper, read a paper about this, and actually a lot of these stars around here that we see out here, farther out, they are actually part of the double cluster. So it actually extends farther out than you think. Uh, you have to take a deep image in order to start to see some of these pictures, some of these stars. So a lot of these stars out here are actually part of the double cluster. So when you see a star, when you see a picture of the double cluster, you see these two compact double cluster, you know, uh, open clusters. That's actually not true. There's actually more there than you think. Al? Yes. Yeah. In that image, you seem to have a lot of point sources. Are those all stars? Every one of these are stars. Every star, every point you see here is a star. 
And you can notice the stars are round even at the corners. <laughs> That's what the epsilon does for you. What? The flat fielder, the flat field optics. How much exposure is this? Uh, these are, okay. This was five minute subframe, two pictures. Total. Total. Wow. Two pictures. Yes. Now, granted, this was taken in a dark sky location. But yes, that's f2.8 is an extremely fast system. Yeah. Yeah. And you can do this. Because I wanted to take a picture of Hartley 2. I wanted to get that shot without having it speak too much. And the only way to do it was to take a few pictures. I didn't have the tracking capability. And even if I did, I can track on the stars or I can track on the comet, but I can do both of them at the same time. And of course, the comet Lovejoy. Uh, now, this doesn't show up very well, but the tail extends all the way up. It extends. It actually extends out of the field. And you see that the you see the stars are streaked because I actually tracked on the comet. Uh, the the Los Vandy Gemini you know, the Los Vandy Gemini mount has a feature in it which is very nice. It's on. It's built into the system in which you can actually put point A, point B where the comet's going to move, and you use a planetarium program to do that. You get the right ascension for point A, right ascension for point B, and the interval and the time interval between. You program yeah. it, and you put it into the mouth. Yeah, look at the TV monitor. You can see okay. the tail all the way up. You can see the tail all the way up. And once you do that, once you put it point A, point B, and you know, R index for the comet, the mouth, the old the Los Bandy Gemini, will actually track on the comet, because it actually will step, it will actually disregard the right ascent, you know, uh, subgeral mode, and actually will track. It will tell, you tell it to go from point A to point B, this time period, it will actually follow that path that you told it to do. And in this case, it will track the comet. <coughs> Alright, so basically I just have some general information. And now these prices have, and this is generally the used market, you know, new has changed, now the T7 is I think T8 or T9 or some such number. They keep changing every year. And of course, you can also go on the used market. You can, and again, buyer beware, but I, you can go on to Cloudy Nights or you can go to Astro Mart and you can find some very nice used DSLRs up there if you don't want to spend new for new. So right now, you know, tripods can be $10 or the sky's the limit. Of course, I talk about the Ioptron sky trackers and some of the smaller general purpose mount that can take up to say 40 and 50 pound instrumentation load. Um, so these are just general mounts that they that are out there right now. Again, you can sky's the limit for what you want to purchase and buy. Remember the mount is the most important part of any imaging setup. You want it more stable. So you don't want to be at the edge of the limit of, of your mount. So if the payload that's an, let's make an example. Let's say the payload uh, capacity of your mount is 50 pounds. Uh, you should only put 25 pounds of instruments on that uh, on that mount. You shouldn't go much beyond that because uh, to be safe. Now I've actually gone to 100 percent. If you know what you're doing, you point at a certain part of the sky, you load it just right, you you know make sure that it's balanced as well as it could be, and at a certain position you can actually go 100 percent. That's because I'm a, a masochistic and I want to do everything I can. <laughs> you know, I like to push until I go off that cliff. But that's me. You, you know, sage advice, don't go beyond 50%. So here's some of the programs I use. I use Images Plus. I love Images Plus for my DSLR work. Now for CCD stuff, it may not be the best program to use. But for, um, uh, again, the DSLR stuff, it looks great. Uh, backyard EOS, I use that for the solar clip stuff. The EOS utility that Canon provides is free. Um, of course, if you want to disguise the limit, you can get uh, Maxim DSLR, which is you know 400 bucks. Image processing programs, I use Photoshop, which is now a Photoshop CE uh, CC, which is now a subscription service. You can get GIMP, it's free. You get Images Plus to do some of your image processing. You can't do all of it with Images Plus, um, but you know you can do some of the other programming, and that's about two hundred dollars. You get the total package, which is the image processing and uh, the camera control. It's about 
$240. I think it's worth it for DSLR. Maybe. And we got other miscellaneous programs you'd find out there, Deep Sky Stacker for planetary stuff, Auto Stack for planetary, Registacks, Nebulosity, uh, PixInsight. Yes, Mario? I'm going to put in a plug for PixInsight. I consider it, it's a learning curve, but there are books out now. I think it's the best processing software out there, and you get a lifetime of upgrades every time it comes out. Yeah, it's about 230 euros. It is, uh, it is recommended that you they look into that. that once yes. for, the, for the rest of your life. Right. And they're always coming up with improvements. Okay. Um, and I have other reference sources. The, the one that I really like is the new CCD Astronomy by Ron Wadaski. It's out of print, but if you can find it, grab it, because it actually it's a great primer for just all deep sky imaging. Um, and then we have other guides that uh, Jerry Rodriguez uh, puts out. He does an online stuff uh, at astropix.com. A lot of different guides on DSLR, uh, planetary imaging, and the like. Astro he also has Astro software, imaging software that he talks about in that link down below. And of course, Michael Covington also has a digital SLR astrophotography book. And so, thank you very much, and that's my talk. Uh, thank you. Any questions? Yes, Joseph. Can you comment on what I sort of recommend? Some ah, of these okay. cameras go up to like. Yeah. But what's realistic? And what's right. What's realistic? Well, again, if you have an older camera, say 10 years old, you shouldn't go much beyond 800 to 1600 ISO. Some of the newer cameras, you can go beyond that. So really, I don't know. I don't. The most modern camera I have is the is the uh, that I use for astrophotography is the um, T4i, and that I only go up to about 1600 ISO. Um, but Again, some of the new cameras may go beyond. You should try it. One of the things that I like to do is, I like to try things. You know, I will actually crank up the ISO on some images and see how much noise I get. If it starts to get unacceptable, then I back off. So again, whenever you're doing any of this stuff, you know, be adventurous, play around with it. I mean, all of this is time. <laughs> there one of the things that, back in the day when I did film, there was a saying somebody's told me once, and he said, Film's cheap. And what he was saying was, it's all about the subject matter. It doesn't matter how many rolls of film you blow through, if you get the subject that you wanted to take a photo of, you just, doesn't matter. Film is just film. We didn't care. Today, film is, film is cheap, digital <laughs> is even cheaper. Because you can delete it, throw it away, try it, start over again. So again, it's these are things that you know, you should experiment. So. Roger Ann Clark has a very good uh, dissertation on choosing the ISO. It has to do with the quantization damage in the digitization process and how, it, how that affects stacking. And you basically want to use the lowest ISO for which your, your uh, ADD step size is a third of an electron or less. Oh my. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually pretty easy to figure out. <laughs> uh, no, but you know, it's, it's, so, you know that's, that's great. And which, which, for digital for stacking, you for, right, really for my ADD that comes up to that comes up to ISO 800. For my 60, it comes to 1600. Right. In general, 1600 to 3200. Right. Is and in general, because it also depends on your camera, because every camera and brands are different. So some can go slightly higher, some a little bit lower. So again, experiment, experiment, experiment. Uh, I've gone I've gone to 3200 in imaging and I've got an acceptable images. Again, it's what you were willing to accept. Um, so another little factoid about that also, if you want more color, you go and bring it down even more. You do 400 ISO, not 800 ISO, 400. Your color rendition actually starts to improve with a lower ISO. Try it, you'll see that. It will be slightly, the colors will be a little bit richer with the lower ISOs than the higher ISOs. So a lot of times when I'm doing solar eclipse imaging, I will be at 200 ISO when I'm imaging total solar eclipses. While deep sky, I'm gonna be up near 800 and 1600. 
because the color rendition that you get with the lower ISO is actually better. So a lot of the corona stuff, the red color you get on the corona for prominences are bright red. They really come out really well with the lower ISOs. Yes? You mentioned mirror lock. What, what's that? Uh... So mirror lock, what do you do is, so for DSLR, which is digital, digital single lens reflex cameras, they have a mirror that actually, when you take the photo, daytime photo, you, you can, when you look through the viewfinder, you have this mirror, which is diverting light from the lens up to the eyepiece in the camera. When you take a picture, it flips the mirror up. And so now light can come into, um, onto the digital chip. And then it flips back down again. Well, what you want to do is, in that flipping up and down of the mirror, it bounces the system and you get these micro vibrations. So if you want to get rid of any vibration, you want to lock the mirror up and keep it up. And that's in the menu to do? Yeah, it's in one of the menus in the camera and just look it up and you can find it. Again, one of the things also, people don't like to do it. I know uh, a lot of people don't like to do this is read the manual. There's a lot of interesting <laughs> stuff in that manual. Oh, by the way. And especially, you don't want to be reading the manual when you're sitting in the dark trying to move the red flashlight going, oh, uh, what is that menu item? No, you, you should know this way before you even get out of the field. You should know your camera. You should know your equipment. I, I, you should be able to pick up your camera and not even look at it and be able to just start to you know, just glance at it and start to go through the menu and know exactly where to go. You shouldn't do it in the, in the dark. Yes? What duty cycle do you use relative to exposure time and the time that the, the shutter is closed because of sensor heating? Uh, I usually go about 10 seconds. It's enough time. But again, I, I like to also do the, the dark frames. And what I typically do is I actually take a dark frame at toward the end because that's when the, the camera is heated up the most. It's gone through. Also, you want to turn off the display. So that back display, and, and when you look at your display that, you know, to do the preview, turn it off. That's one thing you should do, turn that off, so that you, because the display is actually a heater. It actually starts to heat up the camera. And the least amount of heat that you can produce, the better. Um, the 10 seconds is about a good time. It gives it a little bit of time to refresh itself, cool down a bit, and before the next shot. Yes? Um, I do a set, something very similar to what you do, except I use camera lenses uh, mm -hmm. instead of uh, telescopes. And it works quite well. The images of mine that were posted earlier were done with the optics and the sensors, all pure camera. Okay. Again, uh, a, way, a really nice way to uh, get into this is to actually take your camera, put on a tripod, go outside and take night shots. Go to the ch a church that's lit up, you know, with the lights, and actually take a few shots and experiment. You know, take some shots of the of night scenes, of buildings, of streets, of houses, of the Milky Way, say, and experiment to show what you can do with your camera. Because by starting slow, you start, you know, it's it's easy to just place it on a tripod, open the shutter for a few seconds, close it, and then actually view it in the back and say, wow. Okay, I need to go more exposure or less exposure, or oh, I kicked the tripod. I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't move away from the tripod. You know, you learn these little tricks by doing the simple things first. I tell people, don't hook it up to a telescope first. You know, hook it up to the tripod. Put it on a rock, and use the soft timer. I mean, all these cameras have tough soft timers. You can set it to 10 second soft timer. Push the button and step away, and just have it take a shot. Come back and take another shot. A lot of some of these shots that I've taken were actually taken uh, like I think one of the scenes is showed not, maybe not, not this these photos, but I was in Luxor, you know, on the Total Solar Eclipse tour, and there was the moon in the background with this statue in front. I didn't have a tripod, so I stuck on a stone, did the auto timer, stepped back and let it take it, and I took a couple of shots and I took a shot of the moon with the statue in the, in the foreground. So you know, again, it's all about experimenting. It's all about having fun. Remember, it's all about having fun. That's, that's my opinion. No, I still think it's fun. You can definitely tell in my voice that I still like astrophotography. I do a lot of, I not only do deep sky, I do planetary, I do solar, lunar, uh, I do aurora pictures, and it's all, everything is, every one of them is a little bit different. 
and it's fun. So that's what I think uh, everybody should do. It's just have fun with it. <laughs> yes, back. Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, you know, does the Images Plus software, can you do that on a Mac, or is it just PC? I think that's just PC. Uh, again, do your research, go online. There are some tools that are uh, Macintosh-based. Others Nebulosity are. Is Nebulosity? OK, so Nebulosity can be used on a Macintosh. Thanks, John. Anything else? Yes, John. Let me just add to that. You have to get the, the Mac version of Nebulosity. You can't use a PC version. OK, so there's a PC version of Nebulosity, and there's a Macintosh version of Nebulosity. So you have to get the right version. Fix Insight has Mac. Oh, OK. Fix Insight has Mac and PC. So if you buy one, it's both. Do you have to? You have to download two separate versions, but you pay for one. OK, so you only pay for one. You can you download the version that you have, that you need, but you only pay for one once. Also Thanks, Mark. Linux. Sorry, Linux? Also supports Linux. Oh, OK. It supports Linux also. <laughs> Great. Thank you. OK. All right. Thank you very much. So thank you very much all for coming out tonight. Brief announcement, we, our speaker next month is going to talk about some Earth orbit crossing objects and uh, the peril we face every day. Probably everyone um, read the articles on Chicxulub Crater and some of the really cool information they got out of doing some coring of, the, of that. And so if you haven't seen it, you've got the Proceedings in National Academy of Sciences journal and there's a great article on it. It's fascinating. Um, and so we should have a great talk next week. I forgot the speaker's name. So <laughs> but I will put out a notice very shortly. It should be great. It should be really great. Um, so thank you again for coming. There's refreshments here. Uh, eat it all. I don't want to take it. Uh, and uh, have a great night. Thank you very much.